right now is to do Dr. Ed Stewart. Uh, Lisa is a senior lecturer in animal welfare at Murdoch University and consultant to the bioexport, red meat and the poultry industry. She has a PhD in uh, clinical veterinary science and is a qualified lead auditor and animal welfare assessor. Uh, Dr. Stewart's previous post was with Bristol University Vet School, where she was part of the animal welfare training program, delivering animal welfare uh, ops training worldwide. Prior uh, to her work at Bristol, she managed an inspection team responsible for a third-party animal welfare and traceability inspection for farms, abattoirs, hospitals and packing shops. She was also employed as an independent consultant to the retail and restaurant industry, uh, providing uh, advice on the creation and management of animal welfare standards. In 2006, she was one of four representatives that were awarded the British Society of Animal Science, RSPCA, uh, for outstanding contributions to scientific research, information transfer and training in the area of farm animal welfare and cattle stunning and slaughter. Uh, let uh, Lisa speak. Lisa Whiteman, please.
say she tends to cover minimal minimum wealth by quite a lot. So it doesn't even necessarily connote that she's actually had a very developed education or something like that. It's quite different. And also something that I know more in Australia than in the UK is there's a lot of variation between the the, the two different states in terms of the the amount of debt that they have to pay. We've also got majority, they were directly built from uh, uh, the vehicle shed, retail livestock, the stockmen, and also the equipment that they had to um, produce and sell. And that's what really initiated that animal welfare aspect of it. Um, on top of that, we had a lot of retailer pressure as well. So the major retailers in the UK, they started to develop their own animal welfare standards, and they used up the market resources to promote their in Australia, we see this very dramatically. We've also, just an introduction first, and we've also seen the importance of animal welfare standards in respect to um, countries such as Australia. And Dr. Bolton talked about the OIE associated mental health standards. Um, the code itself, what I want to describe today is how that really feeds into the actual MLA, like the Centre of Operation Procedures and Monitoring Systems, they use the OIE code as a baseline for their for their particular um, treatment of the animals. But can we describe the OIE code as an animal welfare standard? If we look, I'm, I'm all for definitions, and, and um, if we actually look at the global definitions of what the standard is, can we actually describe the OIE? general rules, but they do help you understand and start to implement animal welfare standards um, as we have them. So first and foremost, we like to think of standards as things that we have to do. So things that contain a must clause. So you must provide animals with some food and medical supporter, or um, you must ensure that um, animals have been treated and sterilized properly. Follow that first clause. So they actually contain standards within the 
stop there. The things that we have to do that are needful, but we also desire, Lord, to be a better guider, so a better messenger of comfort that your good news can be sent to our hearts and our minds. If we, however, look at that verse from the other day, the OIE study, there's very, and I'm talking now about the chapter of the OIE study that's very concerned with mobile phones and small phones, there is actually very few refinements within that chapter that fit that definition of a standard. So things that we are prohibited or things that we need to do. And I've listed them here. So first and foremost, it does provide characteristics of animal restraint efforts. And I'm sure when you've been reading um, a lot of the information about uh, the OIE case and perhaps you've come across some of these kinds of restraint efforts. So restraint methods, there is a requirement that we provide um, animals with a non-sticking claw when they're holding on to a restraint handle or some other claw head. That we avoid the application of pressure on those animals to the point that we can cause them to struggle or to break down when they're um, in a restrained position. That we engineer them to reduce noise in the environment so that animals aren't startled or distressed when they're actually using that equipment. Um, that there's an absence of sharp edges, so we're actually maintaining the equipment to make sure that we're not causing injury to the animal. And that we can avoid skin absorption or, or skin immunity, so we're not disrupting the animal during the restraint phase. And when we read the OIE case, we can read it in such a way that they are actually restrained. So it's important that those are built into the text of the case. The second mandatory requirement as you read the case is really in relation to animal handling and what methods we can use to handle them. Um, and, it, and it's really referred to methods that cause them distress. So let me just give you like pushing with baby's tail, grasping at its outer edge, pulling on its right ear, and then putting its head to the front and kicking its head from right to front to cause it distress when it's not used. So that's really it in terms of the, uh, the OIE, OIE case and what it actually teaches. But what we've done in terms of the abstract of that case is that we've taken other recommendations from within the abstract case and we've actually turned them into some industry's requirements. So we've taken elements of the OIE case that we think are important to welfare that consumers can give us as food for thought for welfare and we've converted those into some industry requirements. What we're seeing in practice is that we are seeing much, a much more rapid and higher level of OIE implementation in our trade and care sector through abstract cases. The other thing that OIE doesn't do is it doesn't necessarily prohibit or promote the use of surgical treatment and equipment. And there has, I have read certain things in certain press releases, et cetera, that talks about certain pieces of equipment not being OIE compliant. But there's actually no reference within the OIE case that states that you mustn't use certain pieces of equipment, providing that it satisfies some of the criteria that I've previously mentioned. So things like weight testing of cattle, although that we believe it to be non-OIE, is actually permitted within the OIE case. So we don't need um, high-tech restraining equipment as far as the OIE case is concerned. The only restraining methods that OIE um, consider are listed here. So methods that either immobilize the animal by electromobilization, so by applying an electric current to the animal to put dizzy to front, or uh, a method that causes injury to the animal. So things like breaking the leg, cutting the leg tendon, severing the spinal cord without pain. And the OIE states that is not acceptable. So taking that information and taking the information that's presented in the case, that says that we can see that the OIE code is actually quite flexible in terms of incremental implementation. So when companies can select parts of the code and start to apply those bits of the code in order to improve their overall mobile phone benefits.
no, you haven't got that degree of flexibility with that person. So S cap has already done that process for them. They've actually taken part of the OIE requirements and they've turned them into actually required skills. So we need to understand that as well. So I hope that's a little bit of background in terms of how OIE um, helps to address the differences in those skills. So what is an effective online wellbeing? And when we go about thinking of developing animal welfare centres in the future, what are the desirable elements that we need to consider? Well, really, I've listed it here as a summary. These are the things that I think are important in an animal welfare centre. First and foremost, we have to demonstrate that we've improved animal welfare. Otherwise, there's no point in trying to apply a standard, trying to monitor what's going on, keeping records if we're not actually seeing the results. Um, it's, it's quite um, ironic that in the UK there are a number of animal welfare standards that have a very, very strong welfare focus and are actually supported by um, welfare, well-designed welfare organisations. And when they're looking scientifically, they're actually saying not to improve animal welfare. And in some cases, we actually saw um, demonstrations of adverse welfare effects. So we need to be very aware of that and actually really build that in right at the beginning. We need to demonstrate scientifically that we are improving it. So it's obviously got to include all the requirements that we need to be meeting. But also, it's beneficial if we include a series of recommendations as well, like the org that we were providing. So that will encourage best practice and it will encourage continuous improvement. It's, it's got to be practical and it's got to have stakeholder involvement to make sure that it is practical, to make sure that we can apply it to our farm and our field and our community. And we've heard the last one quite a few times over the last couple of days, and that it's got to be focused on animal welfare outcomes rather than prescriptive requirements which need to be nurtured and negotiated with farmers. But that's actually more difficult than it sounds. So what are the challenges? Achieving all those presents us with a lot of challenges. So the first challenge is we have to make sure that our individual standards are actually being followed. So they're designed well, they're reasonably dependent with a real welfare outcome. And to do that, we have to consider the definition of welfare. And, and we don't we haven't talked about the definition of welfare from an OIE perspective. But really, we can, we can summarise it as two fundamental things there. The first is with the animal case, so it's the definition of what the animal has to do. If we can demonstrate both of those, then we, that gets us good, effective animal welfare outcomes. To capture that information, we tend to focus on five key words. And we've already seen that in the past couple of days as well. And what the five key words do is that they describe the state of the animal. So it's an animal-based analysis. However, if we look at most of the animal welfare standards that are out there in industry, not just our own industry, but other animal-based industries, most of the standards are actually based on research data. So they're looking more at the animal environment and what we're giving to the animal rather than the animal itself. The reason for this is that it's very easy to write a research-based standard. So it's very easy to say, we need ten drinkers, we need a non-slip floor, we need um, open rail fencing, things like that. It's very, very easy to just write that into a standard. And it's also very easy to audit as well. So it's, it's, the auditor can go down with their checklist, how many drinks are in there, are they all working, and things like that. So it tells you nothing about the animal welfare outcome. It only really tells us about the animal and the environment. So we can comply with all those requirements, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we've got a good welfare outcome for the animal. What it does do, though, is that it enables us to identify risk factors. So if we know that the equipment is well maintained, then the likelihood of an animal welfare issue arising is much less than it currently is. But it takes that 
some sense. However, it's not the be all and end all of the Bible in any way, shape, or form. So what we really need to do is start to think about animal safety. And how can we start to describe the welfare state of the animal in our society? This is very difficult in terms of writing a standard and all of these with animal-based structure. It's very, very difficult. And we're all in the same boat. We're all really happy to discuss this. So there's a big project in the EU called the Welfare Quality Project. And they've actually received a number of medals and some outcrops and awarded on an animal basis. And it's meant to help us to assess animal welfare rather than the environment in general. What they found is not only do you need very experienced auditors that have had experience in animal welfare assessing it, but you also need a lot of time because you need to observe animal behaviour over a prolonged period. You need to look at animals moving through the system. You need to take a stock of animal care data, etc. And they found that you need it to carry out successfully their audit of a farm would take about six years, which just isn't the case for some animal welfare. I mean, at the moment, in the work that I do, we carry out a farm audit in about one and a half hours, and we carry out the next audit in about five hours. So they were looking at doubling that time, but it was only going to be looking at that time during the animal welfare assessment period. So really, when we start to think about development of animal welfare standards, we need to combine the two. So we need to look at resources, but we also need to consider outcomes and accountability for those outcomes. And the best standards will protect the animals in some way, shape, or form. The second challenge is that the standard needs to be technically correct, and it needs to be based on the best and latest science as well. And this is something that I know some of you have been talking about quite a lot this year. But the clauses included in the animal welfare standard have to be based on scientific rigour. However, there is a limit to the roles in which science can play, and it's sometimes overshadowed by areas of public concern. And a good example of this is um, uh, a standard, also a piece of legislation in the EU, which is concerned with animals observing other animals being slaughtered. So the actual standard stated that you cannot slaughter an animal in front of another animal. And that was put in the UK, and it was in legislation, it was in a number of detailed standards, yet there was no sound scientific reason for that being there. And actually the scientific evidence suggested that animals are not stressed and they're not affected by seeing other animals slaughtered. And unfortunately, that area of public concern actually had a detrimental effect on animal welfare because what happened in an abattoir environment is that in order to slaughter an animal, you're actually moving it away from the other animals in the group, so they are extending the time between killing the animal and slaughtering it, and they're actually seeing more animals recovering on the line before they were slaughtered effectively. So it actually had an adverse effect on the welfare outcome. So we have to be very careful when we're taking ethical considerations into account. Animal protection is quite a broad topic. I'm just going to go with yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, we also need to be aware of the different science that animal welfare standards are based on. And this is the bird, a brief example of that. This is the sunning currents that are used for lots of the sunning of animals. And we can see that there's a variation in different standards. We've got the AMIC standard, the EU standard, and the LRU recommendation. And yet all of these standards claim to be based on scientific evidence. However, it depends on the parameters of the scientific experiment and the laboratory conditions, whether the experiment was carried out on these prepared animals, etc., etc. So we have to take the based on sound science into consideration. The next challenge is, that, and this is completely relevant to the live export industry, is that a standard must be able to be applied universally. So in different areas where they maybe have a different cost base, so they haven't got access to um, necessarily uh, expense 
big uh, high technology equipment and they said we built the dark web. It's also important that the standard deployed in markets are consistent with the standards that we see on our own farms and in our own food labs and our own exports. And there are lots of examples where FTEC standards are actually higher than what we're actually seeing in Australia. So things like some of the handling techniques that are not permitted under the FTEC for children under the age of Australia, some of the sort of more slaughter methods that we see in Australia as well, and also some of the standards in relation to food and water quality. I put this one in as well because this is something that I've come across just recently, which is that when we develop a new animal welfare standard, we need to recognise and possibly integrate existing legislation in a particular country. Um, I put in here some of a, a large uh, global retailer and they just merely stuck with their latest animal welfare standard that um, requires CCTV to be used in all areas where people can consume it. And yet their main suppliers in, e in the EU already have legislation in there that states that you cannot film, directly film, people working in their domestic waters. So they've spent thousands of pounds on on developing this standard and it's already conflicts with the legislation in that country. Um, the standards need to be practical and verifiable. We've already talked about how they need to be practical. So what about verifiable? What does that mean? Well, we need to be able to audit them and demonstrate compliance. So we can't write standards that are then ambiguous or overly confusing. So they have to be measurable. So an assistant auditor can go in and get exactly the same result they did a few years ago. However, no matter how airtight the standard is, a lot hinges on the ability of the auditor. And a poorly trained auditor can sabotage the integrity of a standard and also the integrity of, of a normal welfare standard. And this example here is a case in Sri Lanka where a retailer actually uh, severed their contract with this particular abattoir because the auditor raised an issue of ineffectively trained transfer staff. However, it was transpired that instead of actually looking at the assessment that was actually on the line and actually looking at uh, whether the animals were effectively trained, they were purely looking at the bin head and if the bolt position wasn't in the right place, then they, they were suggesting that those animals were ineffectively trained. However, we didn't know that at all because the only way you can assess effective training staff is to look at the bin head itself. So the competence or lack of competence of the auditor had massive consequences for that particular retailer and their entire business. So it's important that auditors are trained to a consistent protocol and that they are experienced animal welfare professionals and they know how to evaluate the evidence. And really, I say that the success of FTEC really weighs quite heavily on auditors' performance. Next slide, please. Okay, the next thing is quite a new concept, and that is um, that we need to be able to indicate the severity and prevalence of a particular welfare issue. And this is akin to what we see in Sam's presentation last year, where he was looking at audit cheating. One of the approaches taken by one of the large uh, retailers is that they um, assess the rank non-compliances in terms of major or minor non-compliances, and they develop a classified system. So the best performing abattoirs are given a blue or a green status, and then the worst performing abattoirs where the, um, the welfare issues are classed as more severe are given a red status. The benefit of this auditor system is that it lets us differentiate between a major welfare issue that we have and then a non-compliance that maybe just relates to a pet safety issue or an FTEC issue. So we can differentiate between a systematic problem with welfare and then something that we could maybe be isolating as a case of animal welfare problems. And what they've done is they've used this to determine audit cheating. So the abattoirs that come out with a blue or a green status are put 